In all of my videos covering Definitive Edition, I haven't actually made any real content on Future Connected. One of the reasons for that is that there isn't really that much to cover about Future Connected that's worth making a specific video about, since in many ways it's very similar to the main game. So instead, I wanted to make a video covering all of it. That's right, in this video we'll be covering every important change from the main game and everything you might want to know about Future Connected. As always, there will be spoilers on the... Actually, no, no, there will not be any spoilers in this video because there's nothing gameplay-wise to really spoil. But, as always, I would appreciate if you subscribe to my channel if you enjoy my content and want to see future content for the series. With that done, let's get into it. So if you are, for some reason, unaware, Future Connected is the new epilogue story included in Xenoblade Definitive Edition. It focuses much on Melia and the future of the High Entia. It's short enough that you can beat it pretty much in a day, but it can still be a decent experience for what it is. You're given Shulk and Melia who have the same arts they have in the base game and play functionally identical who start at level 60. Additionally, you are given the brand new Nopon party members Nene and Kino who start at level 58. They are Ricky's children, and these are the only party members you are going to get, and as such, your team options are much more limited than the main game. Especially since you might have to deal with either the Shulk or Melia AIs, which are not the best. Now, I know what you may be thinking. New party members in this game? That sounds great! So why didn't I bother to make any character guides on Nene and Kino here? Well, as it turns out, they share their arts with Ryan and Charlotte from the base game respectively, with seemingly only a few differences to some animations and hit counts. Otherwise, they are functionally identical in how they perform, and in all of their stats. They may also have some slightly different art names, but you'll notice mostly the same effects. Now, one thing that you might want to keep in mind is you likely won't be able to level up all your arts all the way, so something like Headshot Kino isn't going to be the most useful. As far as some more specific differences, Nene seems to have some longer animations on many moves than Ryan, making her slightly worse than him, especially since she won't get the major benefits of the level 12 cooldowns and doesn't have Dunban to buff her with Peerless. But with Berserker in the standard Ryan set, she can still deal out a lot of damage. It's just likely you won't see anything massive you may be used to seeing from Ryan. Regardless, since you have pretty limited party diversity, Nene is pretty much essential for any party setup for being the only tank you have, so she should pretty much be used all the time. Against many of the lesser enemies in Future Connected, you'll still be able to get the authentic Ryan experience of one-shotting people with short drive, so don't worry about that. As far as controlling her, you likely won't notice any other differences on that regard. She has a lot of HP, she's pretty tanky, she can increase her strength quite a bit with Berserker, and she has access to all the same basic red arts that Ryan has. She's a very good party member for being able to apply all the debuffs Ryan came with Dive Sabat, like Agility Down and Paralysis. And she's probably going to be your main form of topple and daze that you have in your entire party. As such, this can make her a pretty essential team option and something someone who would really benefit from having the topple plus and daze plus stems that you get in this game. You should have no ke trouble keeping aggro with the amount of damage you have as long as you're running the standard Ryan setup that relies on Berserker as your main aura. And since the vision mechanic doesn't exist, which I'll explain a little bit more later, she becomes even more invaluable, just because you need to make sure you'll have someone who's able to soak up all of these attacks. As far as Kino is concerned, he is likely going to be an even worse damage-wise character than Sharla because of the limitations of the game, but will still likely end up being more functionally useful once again because of party limitations. Healing has more value when two of your four party members are Shulk and Melia, and just because of the fact that once again there are no visions. There's also no chain attacks to worry about, so you remove one of Charlotte's bigger weaknesses since you don't have to worry about Kino's chain attack synergy with his bad art coverage. Unfortunately, he still has basically the same talent art Sharla has, and I don't really know of any heatsink that you can have to really decrease the negative effects of that in this game, at least not to the same effect that Sharla's can be. As such, he's a lot more limited in what he can do, and Drive Boost isn't going to be as great on him as it might be on Sharla, so it might be worth investing in his other aura to just be able to keep aggro off of him at all times. Still, healing can be very valuable in this game, and Kino at least has some purpose, even if he's not going to be doing the most damage or being the absolute greatest character ever at all times. He at least feels more essential to the party in this game than Sharla will feel in the base game, and as such, that makes him slightly more valuable. The party I used for much of the game was some variation of Shulk, Kino, and Nene. Now, I know this is technically Melia's story, but that just seemed to be the party you would have the most success with, just because you'd have the safety of Kino for healing and the tankiness of Nene that you're going to need. And I think Shulk is going to just be all around a superior option to Melia, just because of the utility he provides with armor, the fact that his AI is a little bit better than Melia's is, and the fact that he's a great character control for damage and anything and the like. 
Now, if you want to run both Shulk and Melee, that is absolutely fine, and you can probably ditch Kino and have plenty of success if you want a more damage-based party. That's just what I did kind of for safety, and I was still able to beat the game in under 7 hours. And that is with getting all the Pond Spectres and doing quite a bit of other quests. You can kind of just see just how short this game is in general. You'll probably only get to about level 75 to 77 or so, and that's really all you need to be able to do everything the game has to offer. So just keep that in mind while playing, and then besides that, just enjoy yourself. Many of the other differences in this game are all ways to simplify the gameplay further. Skill trees have been completely removed, so none of the really broken skill links can be used in this game for the characters. Additionally, all gems you collect from the field will already be crafted without the need to use the crafting mechanic yourself, much like how all cores worked automatically in Torna. Gems don't go to the maximum level either, though, so they will not be quite as strong. It appears that damage in general was nerfed in many ways with a lack of extra options available to you, mostly because it seems like they wanted to simplify the experience and keep it short. Over the course of the game, you likely won't be able to level up arts to the max, so make sure to focus hard on everything that's going to be important, like leveling up Monado armor all the way to the complete max, and ignoring everything else. As far as some other things... I'd personally focus on backslash and slit edge as much as you possibly can. Slit edge is just a really, really good art for lowering enemy physical defense by 50%, and backslash is just a great damaging art in general. Stream edge and air slash function really well as break arts and as just secondary physical arts that you can use. Monado Buster is also a physical art you can use, but I'd probably just focus on using the more utility-based Monado arts like armor more than anything else. Speed and shield don't have as much use this time around, I'll go in a little bit more why that is a little bit later on, but armor is basically always going to be useful no matter what. 75% damage reduction is one of the absolute best abilities you can possibly have in this game. As far as Kino, I'd focus mostly on his healing abilities, as you might expect. Drive boost I don't think is as powerful in this game just because you don't have access to heat sink and you don't have access to many of the other things that make Charlotte's drive boost so powerful, and you just don't get to level up things as much as you probably would want to otherwise. Um, as far as everything else, um, Nene, you're probably going to want to run all the things that are really good on Ryan. I personally like going for damage, so I'm leveling up Sword Drive, Berserker, and Magnum Charge as much as possible, or Magnum Starch, my apologies. But if you want to have a more well-rounded set against um, some stronger enemies that are going to have more HP, Bone Upper and Dive Sabat, or Chive Sabat, are both really, really good arts just making sure you're going to be able to reduce enemy agility and give them Paralysis as a debuff. Those are very, very powerful for just increasing your chances of success as much as possible. As usual, Wild Down and Shield Basher, really, really good arts for just having ways to um, topple and daze the enemies. As far as Melia, I'd probably stick to most of her main elementals that are really, really good, and Spear Break and Starlight Quick, which is just really, really good as a combination together to force topple on enemies. That's really good to combine with the other ways to topple enemies like Wild Down and um, an Auto Cyclone if you want to use that. Earth and Ice are still going to be your best damaging abilities, so make sure to keep that in mind. And Copy's just great for having everything that you want to have up at all times. So perhaps the biggest gameplay change are the Pond Spectres. The Pond Spectres are basically not pawn you can find in the overworld of Future Connected. Each one will have a short quest for you, and if you complete the quest, they will join your team. If they join, they'll be able to exist in battle and contribute in their own ways with minor damage and other effects. There are 12 in total, and they are split into three groups of four each. You have the red, blue, and yellow teams. Once you recruit a Nopon from each team, you are able to perform a special attack called a Union Strike. You will see a special animation if you can correctly time some command prompts you can increase the effects of the Union Strike. Think of it like an all-out attack from your other favorite anime RPG, Persona 5. Union Strikes replace chain attacks in Future Connected and can only be used if you fully fill out the party gauge in the top left of the screen in the same way you'd fill it out normally. Once it's filled, simply press down on the D-pad to scroll to the Union Strike and use it. You'll be given the option of Red Comet, which deals damage to a single target and a decent amount to nearby enemies. Blue Caress, which heals the party significantly and grants regeneration along with debuff immunity to all allies. Or Yellow Chaos, which forces Daze and Strength down on all enemies in the area and the days will last for a very, very long time. Now, hitting these command prompts is a lot more difficult than it should be, and not because of the timing necessarily. It's the same timing as a lot of the other timings you might be useful used to in the based game, but the problem is that these timings, you've got these really, really distracting animations in the background, and that can make it much, much more difficult to hit them than they should be. Occasionally, you'll be given an extra chance where you may choose to use a second Union Strike in a battle, with the restriction that the previous one you just used cannot be used again. 
I'm not exactly sure what can help trigger the extra chance, but having more Pawn Spectres unlocked seems to raise the chances greatly. Union Strikes can be very powerful, and while not as varied and interesting as Shane Attacks to me, work pretty well for the shorter type of game to the Connected is. Make sure to recruit all the Pawn Spectres you see to give yourself the best odds of victory in battle. Once you have recruited them all, you'll be able to fight the game's hardest enemy in their final quest, so if you like a challenge, then it's all worth doing. As far as some other things to keep in mind, the vision mechanic does not exist in this game either, so there is no way to change things if an enemy wants to use a dangerous attack. It's just gonna happen, which is a nerf to quite a few Monado arts that rely on that mechanic to be useful, like shield and speed, which I mentioned earlier. And that's also why focusing really hard on leveling up Monado armor is going to be very useful, since it's going to always be useful to mitigate all damage without the use of visions. Another thing that's different about Future Connected is that there are unique monsters like usual, but also Fog Beasts, which function pretty similarly and have their own super cool theme song. Killing these enemies and unique monsters will drop a coin that allows you to buy advanced art books for your characters, so if you want to level up certain arts further, make sure to take advantage of that when you get the opportunity. Fog Beasts also have a habit of drawing in any nearby enemies to them, so if there are any nearby, you'll have to deal with them as well, so make sure you have strong AoE if you do plan on doing that. Otherwise, there isn't much to say about them, they're just additionally strong enemies in addition to unique monsters and they tie in a bit with the theme of Future Connected. The final thing I can think of as far as any significant change in the base game is that you have quiet moments in this game. Quiet moments are basically the replacement to heart to hearts. They are fully voice active moments between two of your party members. They don't have any effect on affinity because affinity does not exist in this game between party members. However, they help you bond with the characters more if you are into that core to sort of thing. Additionally, you have a Pawn Spectre report in your, um, Inventory here if you just want to see what Pawn Spectres you have or some information about them or anything like that. There is a Collectopedia, but there's only two areas in the game, and I haven't really found any kind of major use for it or seen what kind of rewards you can get from it, so maybe you could figure that out yourself. Typically, though, for the full experience, there's not all that many quests. There's not a ton of things to do. You can probably 100% the entire game in about 10 hours. Like I said, I could have tried to cover some future connected content in more detail in separate videos, but I didn't really see the point since there isn't a ton of really major changes. The biggest change just being the Pawn Spectres in battle with Union Strikes and everything like that, and that's able to be covered pretty quickly as you can see. Each Pawn Spectre will tell you the location of the next one, so you don't have to worry about really getting lost because you can just easily see them on your mini-map. Future Connected was a nice little additive to Melia's character arc and just giving a little bit of extra closure to the game in general. The gameplay in it is nothing special, but it's still pretty fun for what it has to offer. You'll get plenty of additional challenges, and the final quest enemy is definitely as hard as the super bosses if you are prepared for it. Regardless though, that about covers everything I wanted to talk about personally in this video, and I can't really think of anything else that I would need to add, so if there is something I did leave out, feel free to ask me about it in the comments and I will try to answer to the best of my abilities. If you enjoyed this video and all my previous guides, please be sure to subscribe to the channel, like the video, comment, and anything else you want to do to support me. I'll be making a pretty large review of the entire game experience very, very soon here. So please look forward to that, and as always, thank you all so much for watching, and have a wonderful day.